Lucy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello and welcome to another installment of And Now for Something Completely Machinima. Uh, I'm Damien Valentine. I'm joined by Phil Rice. Hello. Uh, Tracy Harwood. Hello. And of course, Ricky Grove. Happy to see you. Uh, likewise. Um, and this uh, week, we're talking about your film, and I believe you've got some news for us as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd like to say Merry Christmas to everybody and a Happy New Year. This is the time uh, for that. At our home, we uh, don't celebrate Christmas. We celebrate chris <laughs> which is our Halloween version of Christmas. We have a black tree, and on it has all sorts of monsters and vampires hanging and jack-o'-lanterns and a big uh, Krampus uh, at the top of the tree. And then we put all of our presents in black uh, wrapping paper. So happy chris to those people who want to celebrate that. Happy chris uh, Yes. Two bits of news. There's a Half-Life ret retrospective documentary for 25 years of Half-Life celebrating its anniversary. It covers the background of uh, Valve, its formation, its creation, its idea for Half-Life. Um, there's also going to be a remastered version of it, which I'm eager to play myself. It's terrific. We'll have a link on the show notes so you can watch it. Half-Life is probably... My it's certainly in the top five games I've ever played. Half Life Two is is better, mostly for the graphics and story, but extraordinary game. Hours and hours and hours of fun and imagination and dreaming about it. It's just great. And then the second piece piece of news I have is that I believe it's Grand Theft Auto Six, which is being advertised as coming out. There was a brief sort of trailer kind of thing that was posted i don't know all the details of what's going to be included but it certainly looked good um you know rockstar games they do wonderful details so it's going to be a fascinating thing we'll put a link on our show notes to uh if there's a trailer uh, we'll definitely put that out there and you can keep your eyes I, I don't know exactly when the game's going to be released but um we'll keep you updated here because it's in a very important game for Machinima. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that the uh, downloadable content for Elden Ring looks like it's going to be out in February uh, at some point. And From Software does a wonderful job on their, their DLCs. So this will be a very large, I think there'll be new characters, um, new game play area. It's very exciting. Uh, so keep keep your eyes tuned and we'll let you know. What All right, was the me... name? I'm sorry to interrupt you. What What was the name of that that game that's uh, coming out? Uh, you said uh, Graham, Graham, Graham's Graham Graham's Cracker Auto. <laughs> I've Graham... not heard of that. That sounds I've not heard interesting. That one at all. Is it? Yeah, that's what a is that? it's a coincidence, but that's actually the name of a crime. Uh, you're, Grand Theft Auto. You're pulling oh, my uh, name. You're pulling my leg, Phil. I'll have to check that out. I'm surprised it's actually the sixth I'll in the series. Just start, and... I'll start with the first one. Yeah. Just work my way forward so I know the whole story. Yeah. yeah I'm surprised they've actually managed to make six of them and we've not noticed before. Right. <laughs> yeah, never heard of it. I thought that's an <laughs> urban myth anyway. I thought they'd been on about that for about 40 years, haven't they? <laughs> Yes. Well, certainly it'll be a favorite of all of the avant-garde uh, oh, sure. machinima filmmakers for the Italian those machinima are, festival. Those that are left. <laughs> yeah, those that are left. Well, anyway, let's get on to my film. Well, um, hang on. Before we do that, I've got one bit of news hey. I'd like to share, if you don't mind. I do mind. All right, go ahead. All right. Well, I'm... I'm 
just wanted to say really I don't know if you saw that John McInnes McInnes um studios spoke at the unreal engine festival in new orleans in october about the upcoming film that he's been developing with his uh studio called bad vibes um and he spoke um with folks uh from next and also aws which i think is quite interesting bad vibes is a is a is a really cool project that's um adopting both uh a crowdsourced and a cloud-based approach to um, the production process. Um, so far, really, I think there haven't been that many tools or platforms that have professionalized that kind, that part of the, the creative process. I think it's something that the machinima community did back in those very early days um, when things were shared through the dot-com community forum. Um, but but it's not something that was ever, um, well, folks were never able to commercialize um, the kind of work that they were doing and, and in terms of the way that they were sharing it or anything that kind of came out of it. And the big difference here is that John's approach um, is obviously being done as uh, a means to create exploitable content. So... I think this is one that we really need to be paying attention to because I think what it will do is enable the development of this kind of customizable pipeline, the front end part of it, the creative part of it, which will be done to an industry recognizable standard. And that ultimately means this particular project could, could become quite influential and become, I think, probably the link between some of the very early machinima um, practices in terms of the, the way the community was harnessed and some of these kind of new virtual production tools that these big studios are attempting to work with because it's trying to link those two things together. So I'll say that um, John's doing updates um, through his channel um, and hopefully we'll at some point get to have another chat with him about how far he's got with it and what the reactions to the, the project will be when it comes out, which I think will be next year at some point. That's my news. Good news. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, so Ricky, you've got a, a film called Backflip. Yep. I came across this film um, in an unusual way because I was actually looking for something about a, a motion capture and AI. And that led me to another place, and that led me to another place, and that led me to another place, and that led me to Vimeo. And while I was at Vimeo, I almost always go to the Editor's Choice uh, collection of videos because those are, they're almost always super high quality. And I was just going through looking for interesting stuff, and I saw this backflip. And what intrigued me was the screen capture that was used to be used to identify it. It looked not so strange. It was such an odd mixture of live action and sort of glitched game capture, you know? And so I watched it and I was just knocked out. And now you know me by now, and listeners probably know that I like things that are very creative and that are stylish. Um, they, for, for some reason, that that appeals to me a great deal. And so this, this clicked all the boxes for me. The idea of it, of this guy trying, essentially he's afraid to try a backflip in real life because he thinks he's going to hurt himself, which is probably true. Unless you're very athletic and gymnastic, don't try to do a backflip at home because you're probably going to break your neck. So he thought, well, what if I could do it in this digital virtual world? that I would create. And so <laughs> he goes through the process of trying to train his, his character, which is him. He took a picture of himself and then made a 3D model out of it and left it sort of rough, especially around the face and everything, which gave it a kind of abstract thing. And then he tried to train it to do backflips. Well, initially it wasn't very successful. <laughs> until eventually he could get it um, to where it could do backflips. Now, this journey to create this virtual him 
to do back backflips has all sorts of meandering plots where he does many other things and you get to see what's intriguing is the style is you get to see his real life video but also in the back you get to see the game elements the the vertices and all of that stuff which i thought was just fascinating and very funny um but funny in a strange way because you keep wondering well, yeah you poor guy <laughs> You, you you can't go out and maybe try to do something else now, but he was bound and determined to use his skills as a game creator to make himself do a back, backflip so he could experience. It's a creative hybrid of the game, 2D and 3D in a very unique way. And it also shows how you can use AI to create entertaining and thought-provoking films with all of the snoot, snooting a cock at the... Uh, AI and its legality, this is an example of how to use AI in a way that is interesting and unusual. It also fits into the documentary machinima movement as an essay film. There was a subsection of documentary in real life that was called the essay film, where a person would explore a personal obsession or a personal idea or a personal event, and they would document that. Um, this is exactly that, but it's done using machinima. And for that, there's a third level of creativity that I found fascinating. I just loved this film. It was thought provoking. It was funny. It was strange. It was weird. What did you all think about it? Well, I, love I, start, okay. I started watching it. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to go first because I don't want to have to follow the rest of you. <laughs> um, I watched, started watching it and I thought, what is this? Because it was... <laughs> It was not what I, you know, the first minute or so where you're trying to figure out what's going on here. And it's like, what's Ricky chosen this this month? But then I really caught on. This is actually a lot more than you think it's going to be. Mm. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me is the amount of work that actually went into this. Um, yes. Because it's made to look like it wasn't. It's made to look like this is just like it was thrown together. But when you watch it properly, you think, I know, he, that's the that's the trick he's put a lot of work into this and um it's when it cuts between several different locations and there's one where he's in the, this room and he falls against some furniture and the furniture is actually <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it, it's just a photo of a room and you think that <laughs> he's just got this virtual character against the photo but he doesn't because the furniture moves when he impacts it and the stuff on the top of the table uh, that moves as well but it matches the photo perfectly in the, from the original location. So you don't expect it to suddenly jump forward. <laughs> and so that's a huge amount of work to find or to create 3D models of those, that environment that matches the photo perfectly and to position it so well that you don't expect it to move until it, he, his character hits it. Um, uh, and then to actually make it move and then you say, oh, there's more to this going on than you really mm, think. Mm. Uh, and that's where it really stood out, just how good this film was, because you can see this is, he's put a lot of effort into this. And um, obviously the 3D, he's created that 3D model of his, his character, but he's done it from different angles as well. So he's done a side one and a back one, and it cuts between them, but badly, but it's done on purpose. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, mm. And I, I I could really appreciate this film for that. And that's, it made it really funny. And uh, it's definitely worth, it's it's one of the, it's not a long film, but it's worth sticking through all the way through because you get so much out of it. Then you, if you just give up on it after the first minute, because you have to stick through it to really appreciate it, but it's worth it. Um, so yeah, Ricky, this is a really great choice. And I'm glad you chose it because I would probably not have watched it just from the, the thumbnail. Right. Right, uh, right. We often say this about each other. We we pick a film which we wouldn't have normally watched, but then we we have seen it ourselves and we can really appreciate it and we introduce it to something completely different. So yeah, thank you, Ricky, for choosing this. Oh, you're very welcome. Sorry, Tracy. This... You want me to go next, or do you want to go next, Phil? No, go ahead. Okay. Well, all right. So this guy has created this kind of virtual asset in his own minute image. 
has he used photogrammetry to do that or sort of LIDAR mm. data to do that? That's I suspect, right. That's right. I suspect that's what he's done. And then he's animated it using an algorithm to explore how it learns to do this backflip. Um, and he's taken this process, this Nikita Daiko has, has taken the process from a published research article and then he's tried to apply the technique. And I'm guessing he's probably done it in something like Unreal or maybe he's created another kind of bespoke environment to do it. And actually, I think it's a work of creative genius in many ways. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually using this kind of research-based approach to animate um, where where the virtual character or the agent is given basically um, something to mimic as a, as a kind of reference. And it has to learn how to do that but without a reference for all the interim stages. So the agent learns, uh, basically learns um, some really awkward kind of stages in, in, on its sort of journey to create the end result. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, this is basically, I think, you know, as you said, it's kind of a, a, a sort of a documentary uh, of the learning process, including all these kind of awkward interim stages of the, of the virtual agent learning to do this kind of backflip which apparently took him three years to do, Ooh. three years, which is astonishing. Um, but actually what I love about this is that it's, it's, a, it's a creative way to, to show a research process um, that demonstrates the algorithmic approach. Um, uh, and, and what it's doing is actually putting emphasis on a specific type of game mechanic, um, you know, which, which let's face it, many many of us now really have kind of avoided this because the advancement in mocap techniques means that these kind of learned motions can be stitched together from actual recorded behavior. Or at least what you can do is add more of the interim stages into the process so that the AI has kind of like a path through which it can learn to mimic um, in a much um, quicker and, and more accurate process of learning. So with that in mind, I then thought, right, what, what, what do we know about this guy? What's his background? What's, what is he doing here? So I had a little bit of a dig, <laughs> as I do. And I would suggest that this guy is what I would call a found media artist, because his oeuvre seems to be one of exploring the glitch in dynamic simulation um, by computers. And it's it's glitch only in the sense that the behavior is not a fully functional representation of human mechanical movement, but an abstraction of it um, with, with clearly some key missing information, <laughs> um, such as um, the way in which a set of bones can move at the same time. Um, so animation in in looking at what he's done is really only one of the techniques that I think he's using here. Mm. So so what he has then done as a creator is actually for me the really interesting part of this um, and and the process really, um, because in this film what he's done is he's woven over this learning process a kind of imagined sentient mind state for the avatar in order to devise mm. a story. He's given it a rule. Um, and the rule is about not hurting itself, or at least he's justifying the glitch by presenting us with that additional rule based on his human understanding of why he's not himself been able to throw a flip with his own physical body. Um, so he's commenting on all kinds of human-like emotions, such as mm -hmm. uh, ambition, um, fear, uncertainty, um, I, I picked up achievement, failure, determination. But interestingly, what I didn't pick up on was these other really important human states, such as exhaustion, frustration, and, um, you know, um, energy replenishment, let's say. So he's only picking up on a part of it, but not the whole thing. Um, and then what you've got really is this kind of I, well, some have called it gross, but I would call it kind of voyeuristic style of documentary that's kind of delightfully sadistic at one level and deeply disturbing at another. And it's <laughs> very much in the mould of what I would call experimental machinima, which exploits the glitch in the game. Primarily, that's what a lot of experimental machinima is doing. It's playing with that, that glitch. 
which basically ends up then being um, a satire. Uh, and in this case, what we're talking about is a satire of computer simulation processes. In some ways, it reminded me a bit of Phil's pick um, earlier this yes, week. Yes, yeah, I thought that. so too. Where, but but that wasn't exploring glitch necessarily, but but the codified rules in the game. And it got me thinking, it really got me thinking this one, because um, because if if glitch is what, what we're about, this is a very distinctive style of animation that we've talked about at some length over over some time. And we've seen it many times over the years, really, um, where, the, where the, the focus is a very specific glitch in a game mechanic. Um, and the artist is specifically focusing on that. So I was thinking, right, what else have we seen that does that? And I remembered, as I was sort of casting my mind back, a film from many years ago, which I'm sure you'll all remember really well, which was called The 1K Project 2 by Black Shark. About nine, um, it was about 2000, early 2005, I think it was released. And what that was doing was um, using something called ghost mode, uh, ghost, ghost mode in the, the game Trackmania Sunrise. The glitch that the, the, the guy was playing with um, is basically uh, the mechanic in the game that allowed uh, allowed them to overlay the playthroughs of the game endlessly. You could put thousands of overlaid run-throughs through it, and it would just continue to do it. It all just basically depended on how uh, good your um, com computer and graphic card was, I suppose, in, in, back in the day. Um, and it was a glitch that was kind of... Um, discovered by the community, but it's actually one that the players themselves took full advantage of. There were there were many, I think, as I recall, um, examples of this one K project. You know, well, it wasn't called Project Two. Was I remember there being a Project Three, a Project Four, and I don't know how many different types of variations of it. There were there were many hundreds of examples of of machinimas that came out around the same time that were practicing doing the same kind of thing overlaying the content um but i think what um i've, I've kind of lost my train of thought really but I, I guess really where i was going with it is it's it's not quite the same thing as the as the example that that you've picked up on here ricky because what 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 the glitch is here has is kind of been stitched together over over a kind of a, a over a kind of time period and uh, in order to kind of produce this sort of narrative art but what the glitch in that other one that other example was 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 a kind of simultaneously shown um so it wasn't a kind of a linear narrative at all but a sort of a simultaneous thing um but nonetheless the focus was just on the one aspect of the of the algorithm um in the in the game which i which i kind of thought was really interesting mm. um and super interestingly as well what i did because i i thought you know i remember this is so long ago i, I thought i'm not sure i really fully remember all of what i was told about it back back way back when so i thought i'll ask this guy and see if you know see if he will at least um acknowledge uh you know a little message about you know can you tell us more about the backstory to it um, because I was intrigued by the this glitch idea. Um, and can you believe it? 20 years on, <laughs> 20 years on, he's got back to us with a whole story about it and his role in developing it. And it's truly fascinating. But what I'm going to do with that is a separate blog because it's it's not Perfect. quite the same story as what, what we're talking about. Right. But it's, I think, one of the very first examples I remember that that kind of pushed that boundary and ended up with a really interesting and very successful output from it in fact black sharks 1k2 project made it to the guinness records um and it was the uh, it made it because it was the first example i believe of a french viral machinima so it made it in the french version of it so this this story of, of glitch i think is one that's really really interesting um I have to say, I always thought it would disappear over time, this this focus on this. 
um, because as I assume that, you know, as, as things got patched and, you know, more things were perfected through a kind of a longer dev time and whatnot, I just thought it would go away. Um, but I think somehow it's, it's neither gone away nor diminished in its impact. And it's allowed, I think, artists like Nikita Daikur to make a really unique contribution because what he's able to do is focus on the aesthetic of that very specific imperfection. And in Daikur's case, what we're, we're talking about is the way the avatar learns to mimic movement. So it's fascinating. Thank you. Yep. Really enjoyed it. You've got enough there for a good article. You should write it. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, it's a work of genius. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. I don't think it could be overstated. Um, it's just extraordinary. I mean, it, there are great documentaries, which are informative um, so, and entertaining typically. And then there are great mockumentaries, which are, they're not really trying to be informative at all. It's all about the joke. So, you know, this is Spinal Tap, for example, mm. Pack, packaged as a documentary, but it's just a big spoof for a joke, right? It's rare that something is both at the same time in a way. <laughs> and I think this is genuinely, I mean, this is, it's, it's like you can, if you you can watch this as a documentary of a process of of basically a this is a scientist a computer scientist trying to accomplish a task and and documenting the process of that and all the rough edges of it and everything and and that is exactly what this is and it's also performative like it is an extraordinary comic performance and and the thing that really just blows my mind is that it's both. Yeah. It's not a mix. It's yeah. actually both. Simultaneously, <laughs> it is two things. Well put. And uh oh, I just loved it. You know, I mean, the the nerdy part of my brain just loved what bit of the computer science aspect of it that I could follow, which is most of it, but not all of it. But you know, I loved that. But then, you know, the kid in me sees him bonk his head and 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 oh my goodness the foley the sound work in this is just <laughs> exquisite like i mean it's real i don't know how there's a lot about this film that i i confess i don't know how he did this like it, Damien, you caught something about the photo overlay and stuff like that and that was more specific than i was able to get to on my own watching it I'm not sure how much of that was that I was too busy laughing and being entertained by it to, to really analyze. Um, I watched it twice and both times I, it was, I was just yucking away. It was so funny uh, and, and, and absurd and fascinating. Um, so the only other thing that I'll, I'll say, I'm not going to dig into the, how it was made. Cause I'm not going to pretend that I, I am confident that I know. Um, but one thing it made me think about, I don't know if this is part of his intended message of the film or not, but, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, how close AI is getting to, you know, be competitive <laughs> with human thinking and, and all that stuff. And this is, you know, I've, I've heard some people in the, either in this profession or clinical psychologists or people who study neurologists and they study the brain. And, and many of them insist we are really underestimating just how much computation goes into things that we think of as very Absolutely. simple when it comes to manipulating the body. Yeah. We've spoken on previous episodes about what seeing actually is, is when you try to try to deal with it computationally. It's not just light passing into a thing. There's identification and prioritization and all these things happening for what we call seeing. And yeah, a backflip here, as hard as it is, 
for a human being to learn a backflip, it's probably easier, assuming that you've you've got the the working musculature and are in appropriate shape and aren't too overweight or whatever. It's actually probably a rel relatively seemingly simple thing for a human to learn to do this with maybe some instruction, the instruction to avoid the injury, which is why he embarked on this in the first place, right? If I just go right. and just decide to go do a backflip out in the parking lot, you know, call 911, right? I mean, it's it's not going to go good. He said that when he tried it, he, he ended up with a broken toe. It's like, no, that would, I, it would be career ending for me. Indeed, I think. indeed. It would be a, a neck or something far worse. And yet, I know that if somebody who was a professional gymnast, and if I were in the appropriate level of conditioning, I could probably learn how to do a backflip in a ha in, in in an afternoon from a from a professional, because what I lack is the understanding of what. First of all, what does it feel like? You know, there's the motor memory part of it. What does it feel like? But also, just what physically is involved in making that happen? Yes. You know, it's not just pushing down on your feet in a certain way. It's there's something else. What do you do exactly? And once you're taught that, virtually anybody, again, if you have the appropriate, you know, if your body's in the right shape for it, anybody could do that. And yet, for a machine to break that down computationally and understand it and reproduce it even virtually, this this is this this documentary is a perfect example of oh my goodness, <laughs> how extraordinarily things you don't think about. <laughs> oh just amazing uh so that's what it got me thinking about was you know not some okay it's easy to have some kind of a pat response and go yeah i, I you know I, I like to joke sometimes say whenever i worry about ai taking over the world i just have an interaction with siri on my phone <laughs> you know and then i don't worry anymore you know siri who, <laughs> my wife goes call my husband siri says which husband <laughs> Siri, who oh. tells me, who I say, how much longer is it going to keep raining? Siri says, it's not raining. It's raining. So, like, I'm not worried about AI. And it's easy to be flippant and go, see, this is the reason why we don't have to. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm talking, like, seriously, like, what a monumental task. And then that's amazing enough. But he gets success. Yes. He actually does it. Cool. Like, the, he, he gets it to happen. Once you reach the end of this about 10, 12 minute video, is it what took him three years? But I mean, for us, we can digest in 12 minutes. I mean, I was just it was like at the end of some some classic Rocky. sports movie or Rocky or something where when when he wins, you're just literally. Yeah. I mean, I was cheering. It was just amazing <laughs> because I, I could then. I had felt like I had even the smallest appreciation for how difficult that was. Um, so what a wonderful experience watching this and, and being made to think about all of that. Uh, it just, yeah. I mean, just, just wonderful. Uh, there's how often does a video do all of that? Yeah. You know? Not you that can often. Watch something and oh, neat. He crashed the car. Oh, Hey, funny joke. You know, oh, bathroom humor again from Phil. Great. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> this, it's like, man, my, I felt like parts of my brain that don't light up on a regular basis were lit up from watching this. Oh, that's excellent. I'm you so glad. I'm like it just, yes, just stimulating in a totally different and elevated way. And then, of course, talking to you guys about it and Tracy, I mean, you just had a whole. Uh, insight on this that just it, it, none of that even occurred to me like it's and so now I've got more to, yeah. to think about yeah. as I enjoy watching it again so yeah I mean just bravo and and uh I this Nikita very interesting person who, sure. whoever made this is that's just like somebody I'd love to meet yeah. and just talk to I and mean, yeah. just what a mind going on I'd you know behind this I'd like to point out one last bit before we close out, and that's the narration. Yeah. Now, if, if you had a more talented narrator, 
somebody who was professional and creative and who could do that thing with variety and drama and a beautiful, rich voice, it would almost ruin the yeah. film, I think. Yeah. Because his sort of inadequate but honest and real narration makes a great deal of the film. Of course, obviously the content and the, the visuals and all that, but his narration, his sort of lackluster, sometimes he's excited, sometimes he's not, sometimes he's, he, you know, depressed about certain things and excited about other things makes the thing. It's just so perfect. And that's why I think you should put it in the category of documentary. Hmm. It's actually even more, there's actually something really interesting about that, Ricky. Mm. The narration is synthetic. Is it? He created a voice clone of himself. A 15-minute voice sample oh. was put through something along That's the line. That's right. I've forgotten. Lab. 11 labs, yeah. And then it read, it read his narration. How fascinating. So, yeah, that's part of how uh, it pulled off the the somewhat deadpan, uh, mm. uh, the, the minimum emotion that we've we've spoken about on prior films where Eleven Labs was used for the voice and talked about, yeah, the range of emotions kind of narrow mm. and what that thing can do. I've discovered something really interesting about that, by the way, uh, that I think I'll share with you off air for now. Mm. Um, but... I, I figured out something new about how to coach emotion. Cool. Out of labs. We'll, well thanks for soon, clarifying that. Here. Yeah. 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 But um, he didn't use that here. He actually used, I think the text to voice synthesis with his own cloned voice of himself. Because I think you're right, Ricky, the deadpan that the, the delivery, that flat delivery for the most part uh, and kind of a random sense of peaks of emotion. It, yeah. It, Works, it makes this better. Yeah. It, yeah. It does. In a film where you're trying to be serious or dramatic, it wouldn't. It would be distracting. Yep. But this, it fits with that quirky clothes clipping through his knees virtual yep. character that we get yep, to yep, love. Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. I'm so glad you liked it all. I, I was worried that you might not. It might be too strange for you. So I'm glad. Oh, it's great. It was a really great pick. It's probably my favorite this month, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Me oh, too. that's great. The uh, clothes clipping thing, actually, that's something you don't typically see, even something like I clone, is the clothes are a static model attached to the character. But <laughs> when he's doing those flips and the, the jacket's moving, yeah, that's simulating actual fabric on his body. It's not doing it well, but that's part of the joke. Uh, There's actually a way to do that in iClone. Not that you would ever want to, but if you turn on soft cloth physics and then paint the, the soft cloth physics map, as to treat everything as flexible and like silky, yeah, it will do that. But it'll do it as well as that video. It will do it <laughs> as bad as that video. Yes, it yeah. will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've had, because I've I was experimenting with it with a character that I brought in with AccuRig, um, and actually, yeah, it happened. The, the clothing split apart, and as soon as the physics was turned on, it's just weird stuff happens. And it reminded me a lot of that, yeah. So it's not something you'd ever want to do, but uh, yeah, it's that's that's how that works. Is that basically, and you, you saw it with other objects in this film, there was a lot of physics being applied, the way the bottle wobbled and things like that. I think that those are all within the simulation, and he must have turned on some kind of cloth physics simulation for certain parts of the outfit, and yeah, it 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 really worked well for it. It sure did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think that wraps things up, not only for this uh, week or this month, but also for this year, because this is our last episode of the year. That's right. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you have anything to say to us about this film or about us, um, send an email to talk at completelymachinima.com. You can find our blog with our news and show notes at completelymachinima.com. And uh, that's it for now. We'll be back next year with a brand new episode. So we'll we'll see you then. Take care, everyone. Happy New Year. Bye-bye, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.